I'll call the meeting to order. City Council meeting of October 4th, 2010. Roll call. Mayor Heike. Council Member Reese. Here. Christensen. Here. Anderson. Here. Amon. Johnson. Here. Dockin. Here. Faggerly. Here. Dubliek. Here. Seven present, two absent. We stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Are there any uh, proposed additions or deletions to the agenda? If none, we'll go to the uh, consent uh, agenda. Move to approve. Second. second. We have a motion and a second to approve. Uh, anybody want to uh, speak to anything on there? If not, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Go to the uh, scheduled hearing for uh, rezoning lands from R2 to limited business. And uh, Bruce, are you handling that? Yes, sir. Mayor Pro Tem Reese, members of the council. The city received an application from Craig Lease requesting that the property at 1950 19th Avenue Southwest be rezoned from R2 1 and 2 family residential to LB limited business. The proposal is that the um, structure be lived in by uh, a professional who would also offer or would also um, offer business services at that location and would uh, be planning to have several employees. <coughs> the proposal is consistent with the latest comprehensive plan that calls for 19th Avenue Southwest to become a corridor for medical and uh, professional uses. The rezoning has been approved by the Planning Commission. It's a recommendation of staff that the council adopt the ordinance, assign it a number, and publish it. Okay. Questions? Ron? Thank you, Mr. Mayor Pro Tem. I'll uh, move staff for recommendation that we uh, ordinance, adopt the ordinance, give it a number, and. It's a hearing first to take public testimony. Oh, excuse me. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm supposed to open the hearing to the public. I apologize. Yeah. I'm new at this. <laughs> All right. Are there any comments from uh, citizens in regards to this zoning? Okay. If not, then I'll bring it up to the council. Close the hearing, Mr. Mayor. Close the hearing. Close the hearing. And bring it up to the council. Here we go. Right. Thank you. Um, now I'll uh, move staff's recommendation to adopt the ordinance, give it a number, and publish it. Second. Second. Okay, we got a motion and a second. Any discussion? If not, all those in favor say aye. 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 Roll call. Mr. <laughs> Mayor right. Pro I'm really doing well tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Just rolling right along here. Council Member Rees. Ordinance. Aye. Christensen. Aye. Anderson. Aye. Johnson. Aye. Dockin. Aye. Baggerly? Aye. Dubliek? Aye. Seven ayes, zero nays. That resolution passes. Um, next item is uh, a presentation on the Yellow Ribbon City designation. And uh, we've heard about it. I would also draw you, your attention to the banner on the side. And Trish Appledorn, I believe, you're going to speak to this? Yes. All right. Thank you for being here tonight. Thank you for having us. Um, was it September 22nd, 23rd? The uh, city of Wilmer was designated a yellow ribbon city uh, by the governor of the state of Minnesota. We were awarded the proclamation, and I can read it if you'd like, but I did include it in your agenda, so if you'd like me just to bypass that, I necessarily don't have to read it. Do you, well, you do have it? or Maybe... Um, it's a good idea. <laughs> Maybe it should be read uh, for the uh, public's interest. Wonderful. Whereas the State of Minnesota Proclamation, whereas the men and women of our armed forces are being called to duty with increasing frequency, 
In addition to remembering their courageous service, we must not forget the unsung heroes of war on terror. Their spouses and family members who many sacrifices support the defense of this great nation and whereas the spouses and families of our deployed service members bear an enormous burden of concern and support for their loved ones in harm's way while continuing to perform the daily duties needed to sustain their families on the home front and whereas many cities throughout the country display yellow ribbons and flags in support of the brave men and women serving abroad in the United States Armed Forces and whereas Wilmer, a Minnesota city that encourages its military members and spouses, giving them peace of mind, knowing they have this appreciation, love, and support of this community. And whereas the Yellow Ribbon City campaign honors communities with exceptional records of caring for their military members and families through various programs and public works, and recognizes individuals of, in these communities who have sworn and uphold this standard for future military members and families. It is with this commitment to excellence that Wilmer will serve with honor and distinction as a yellow ribbon city. Now therefore, I, Tim Pawlenty, Governor of Minnesota, do hereby join the Minnesota National Guard in proclaiming the city of Wilmer as a yellow ribbon city. Signed by our Signed governor. Signed by Governor Tim Pawlenty. Um, we had, I believe, about six people from Wilmer join us to receive this proclamation. Um, Commissioner Dawkin, myself, Cammy Nelson, Conrad Bostron, and Deb Kruger all accepted this proclamation on behalf of the city of Wilmer. We have all worked very hard with gaining this yellow ribbon um, award and proclamation and want to thank uh, the city councilman and the people in the community for helping us get this proclamation for the city of Wilmer. With that, <laughs> I want to just bring up that our yellow ribbon signs uh, and in your packet you had a sign, but I did receive another one from Stillwater, what they would uh, look like. I'm not sure how many signs there are coming into the city of Wilmer. Mick, are you aware of that? No. Be five. Uh, the cost of these signs are $62.95 a piece, and um, it would just make citizens aware while they're coming into Wilmer that we are designated as Yellow Ribbon City. Um, so just for your consideration, um, maybe for future reference, if any know of anyone that would like to participate in purchasing one of the signs, I know I myself would be willing to purchase a sign. So. Okay, so this this is a sign that would go in place of the signs that are there now? Nope, it's just a little addition to the bottom okay. of the signs, um, the City of Wilmer oh, sign. Oh, I see. Uh, I, I see the bottom. Okay, I yep. didn't understand it when you <coughs> held it up before. Yep. All right. And Mickey said there was five? Yeah. You believe? So you're looking for um, people that will... Um, <coughs> Would be willing to purchase a sign, or um, if there's a maybe a business out there that would be willing to purchase the signs. Okay, all right. Well, um, we can be proud as a city that uh, we've been designated, and that is a lot of work by um, you and everybody else, Cami and Conrad, uh, in regards to. Uh, getting this proclamation and designation for the city of Wilmer to be a yellow ribbon city and it having been uh, you know uh, there's a number of us I think up at this table that are veterans ourselves and we also have children uh, that are in the armed services at present and uh, having that designation um, and the care and support of our whole community for the families, um, and especially in times like this where they're missing their child's birthday or their first softball game or whatever it may be, or maybe even the birth of their child. Um, these families do need the support, and uh, Yellow Ribbon will be there for them. That's wonderful. That is correct, and we do. We are so fortunate to be living in a city and a, actually a county that is very military friendly and they always have a place to go, so we're very fortunate. Anybody want to uh, comment or ask a question? Bruce. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Mayor Pro Tem. Just like to say thank you for everything you did to um, bring this uh, proclamation to the city of Wilmer and all your work you put into it. You know, I for one did have, have children in the military and have served both uh, at home and abroad as well, and I know it's uh, 
it's a uh, lot of stress on a family when you have a member in the service. And just thank you for doing this. Thank you, Councilmember Dockin. You were at the uh, at the event. Maybe you want to make some comments. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Mayor Pro Tem. Um, uh, again, personally, I can't uh, thank uh, Trish and uh, Conrad Bostrom and uh, Cami Nelson Trewisha for their efforts. Um, but I think we go back to Governor Pawlenty and uh, his insights into how important it was to start a reintegration re program in our st state because we have so many National Guard and Reserve uh, individuals that have been a part of the war for the last eight years. And uh, um, the Adjutant General played a, a huge role, but Chaplain uh, John Morris is the individual that really, I think, got things rolling with respect to making sure that that military personnel were reintegrated properly. They went back at 30-day, 60-day, 90-day intervals because there is so much um, suicide is epidemic within the military today, and post-traumatic stress disorder is is really difficult, and so. Uh, even our chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Admiral Mike Mullen, uh, on October 1st uh, said that communities and veterans can help each other. The United States owes a debt, of, a debt to its veterans and their families that the American communities and their leaders can help repay, the chairman said. And he was in Tucson, Arizona. He said that uh, military veterans and their families are an extraordinary group. And he encouraged local leaders to find ways to employ them and put their abilities to use. And I think that this yellow ribbon designation is a, is a huge uh, accomplishment for our city. Uh, again, Minnesota has 410,000 veterans. That's a lot of veterans when you consider that there are 24 million in our country. Uh, when you look at spouses and children and grandchildren, that's probably about a, a fifth of our population that are veteran related. So we, we are uh, privileged to have so many veterans that live in our community and have done so many great things. And there are at least uh, three of us on the council that can say that we are veterans. Okay. Anything else? Anybody? <coughs> well, congratulations. Thank you. It was a great accomplishment. And we appreciate it very much. Uh, and the recognition of, of Wilmer is being designated as Yellow Ribbon C City. Thank you. We really should give a lot of credit to Cammie Nelson, who could not be here tonight, because she really started this whole process. So. I know Cammie has a... Uh, passion to the extreme. Yes, she does. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you, Thank you, both of you. All right. All right. The next item is another proclamation, and um, it's on uh, domestic uh, violence. And um, I guess I'd, I'd just like to cover a couple things before I read the proclamation, and then I'm also going to call on Connie Schmoll from, um, I'm going to call Shelter House, but I'll, because I'll let you explain the changes, Connie. But um, I've done a little bit of uh, looking into d domestic violence since this uh, proclamation was coming out of uh, designating October as Domestic Violence Month. Um, and I find that it's a, it's a pattern of intimidation and abuse uh, that batters use to control uh, their partners. And um, you know, I, I guess it's easy for us to understand that, that in domestic abuse, there's there's um, there are beatings, and the the physical part of it heals, but. Um, and the arguments end, but however, um, the emotional wounds, um, they erode the victim's self-worth and for the rest of their lives. And abusers uh, typically act out of uh, need for control, and they 
abuse the abuse become the abused become imprisoned by that manipulation and domination and sometimes even believing that they deserve this kind of cruel behavior I uh, checked with uh, our sh sheriff and our chief of police and in 2009 just to help you put it in perspective we had within the city uh, in 2009 442 uh, responses to domestic violence just within our city 442 and in the county we had 165 so far this year we've had 332 um, within our city and 116 within our county so you know it it's right here at home and and uh, we have shelter house uh, who uh, s serves um, victim services to these uh, to the abused um, as as a concern as a city uh, and as a city council uh, on the public safety side um, I questioned both the sheriff and our police chief in regards to what does this take uh, as far as services and time and uh, in every domestic call whether it's the sheriff's department or the police department two officers two officers respond um, it, it, it is a um, a difficult situation uh, to walk into and I uh, sometimes very dangerous and there are hours of paperwork many hours and resources consumed by the crime of the domestic violence the shelter house is a, a real asset uh, to our law enforcement um, as far as like I said before providing uh, victim services beyond the law enforcement contact so with that I'm, I'm going to read the proclamation and then I'm going to call on, call on Connie Schmoll and uh, Connie's going to tell us about an event and also some changes at the shelter house so the proclamation whereas violence against women and children continues to become more prevalent as a social problem due to the imbalance of power due to gender and age whereas the problems of domestic violence are not confined to any group or groups of people but cross all economic racial and social barriers and supported by social indifference <clears throat> whereas the crime of domestic violence violates an individual's privacy dignity security and humanity due to s systematic use of physical emotional sexual psychological and economic control and or abuse whereas the impact of domestic violence is wide-ranging directly affecting women and children and society as a whole whereas it is battered women themselves who have been in the forefront of efforts to bring peace and equality to the home now therefore in recognition of the important work done by shelter house newly named safe avenues and domestic violence programs throughout the nation I Doug Reese as mayor pro tem of the city of Wilmer do hereby proclaim the month of October as domestic violence awareness month and urge all citizens to actively participate in the scheduled activities and programs to work toward the elimination of personal and institutional <coughs> violence against women Connie why don't you uh, come up and introduce yourself and uh, to share with us some of the changes and activities. Thank you, Mayor Pro uh, Tim Dugries and City Council members, and thank you for making that proclamation um, in the Wilmer, City of Wilmer, Minnesota, to proclaim Domestic Violence Month in October 2010. Um, you're following in the steps of many community leaders, state leaders, and even our own President Barack Obama. On October 1st, he proclaimed. October as National Domestic Violence Awareness Month. And in his proclamation, he also stated that it's been 16 years since the passage of the Violence Against Women Act, VAWA. And we have broken the silence surrounding domestic violence in many communities, and we've made a big impact on the number of cases of domestic violence. But we still have a critical issue facing us when one out of every four women will still experience domestic violence and sexual assault at some point in their life by an intimate partner or spouse. 
Um, Barack Obama, our president, also stated that ending domestic violence requires a collaboration of uh, efforts involving every part of, us, of our society. And you alluded to the fact that we need law enforcement. They respond. We need um, our sheriff's departments, our city council members, our county, county uh, our city uh, attorneys and our county attorneys. Um, and they do, they work hard on behalf of domestic violence. So I do want to thank our law enforcement that's here tonight. Even our fire department, they've responded to the shelter many times too. So, and to um, our county attorneys and city attorneys, they really work hard to make a difference and impact domestic violence cases across the nation. Um, I do want to announce Shelter House has gone through a big change and we've changed the name of our organization from Shelter House to Safe Avenues. Along with that we have a brand new logo, we have a new mission statement, a new tagline. And as you can see on our new logo here, um, we are an organization that provides safety. Much more than Safe Shelter, we're also an organization that provides um, advocacy and support and healing for men, women, and children who are victims of domestic violence. We also work with men. We have our safe shelter. We have advocacy programs. We have programs for victims of sexual assault, which is new in the last five years. We also work with children who are impacted by domestic violence because they witness it in the home, and some of them are victims themselves. We have a visitation center, which is one of the highest uh, referred to organizations by our courts when there's children involved in the homes with this domestic violence, a safe parenting time center called Harmony Visitation Center. Our new name can cover that. Shelter House is now one of our programs. We haven't lost that name. It's just the name of our shelter program. Our shelter program is the only shelter in 18 counties in southwest Minnesota, and still 51% of the people who stay in the shelter are from Candio High County. We work with 600 to 700 families every year who are direct victims of domestic violence or sexual assault. Um, safe avenues also um, shows that there are many choices. There are many avenues a person can take to find safety in their lives. If you look at our logo, it has four colors on it. The color purple is stands for Domestic Violence Awareness Month, and you're going to see purple ribbons wrapped around our city all over, as well as the yellow ribbons in this next month to signify that we all care about domestic violence. The blue in our logo is for sexual assault. It's the sexual assault nationally known awareness color. Orange is for parenting time centers, and blue is for child abuse. So we have all four colors on our logo. And if you look closely at our logo, there's an intersection there. Um, there's the paths and the roads. So it's a very fitting logo for Safe Avenues, the new umbrella name for Shelter House. We do have events coming up. And this wonderful proclamation read by Mayor Pro Tem Reese will be done again tomorrow night in a community setting out at Robbins Island. Um, you're welcome to come to that. Our city and community members are welcome to come. It'd be wonderful if we had hundreds of people there saying, let's remember the victims, let's honor the survivors, and let's celebrate what's being done in our community to stop domestic violence and help the victims. That will take place at Robbins Island. It's a beachside candlelight vigil starting at 6 o'clock. Uh, to remember the, those who have lost their lives and to honor our survivors. We also have Purple Night Lights um, all through October. You can purchase a purple light bulb at Safe Avenues and light that on behalf of domestic violence awareness. We have a 5K run coming up on the 16th. We have open houses at our office in Chippewa County. We have one in Sif County and one in Renville County. And we have uh, appreciation breakfast at the shelter for our partners and supporters. So there are many events. I do encourage you to get involved, especially to come out to Robbins Island tomorrow night. Thank you again for the proclamation and for caring. Thank you, Connie, and thank you for being here. And uh, carry it back to your board. Uh, thank you so much for what Shelter House has meant and the, uh, what Safe Avenues will mean within our community and outside of our community. Thank you. I don't know if anybody's got any questions for you, Connie. Yeah, Ron. Thank you, Mr. Mayor Pro Tem, uh, and thank you, Connie, for coming. Mm -hmm. the, you, you had stated that 51% of your clients, I'll call them clients, are from Candy High County. Uh, where are some other places they come from, the other 49%? Sure. I mean, is it other Fif states or just the state of Minnesota? or? Sure. 51% of those who stay in our shelter, which is about 100, people, 100 families a year, are from Candy High County. Uh, we get the majority from this 18-county area in southwest Minnesota. In fact, we are state light, um, funded for eight beds in our shelter. We have 16. We can have six families at a time. Um, until we have eight beds full, we really take anybody from anywhere. 
because that's the criteria with the state funding we get. After we have eight beds, we prioritize the 18 county area. Um, there's a lot of communities in that 18 county area that wish they had their own shelter. If they did, families wouldn't have to leave their home, they wouldn't have to leave their jobs, they wouldn't have to leave their schools. And some choose not to leave that in order to come to safe shelter. I think that's one of the reasons that we are 51% from Candioi County. It's more accessible for people in our own community to go to safe shelter. What's an, is there an average stay that, that uh, a family or uh, a gal would stay there? Is it two weeks, five weeks, a month? or? Yeah. Uh, the average stay is 18 days. We have people who stay for three, four months, and we have many people who only stay for a night or two. If they attain an order for protection from the court systems, it's still a very dangerous time for them. In fact, the Minnesota Coalition for Battered Women puts out a femicide report each year, and in many of the cases where somebody was murdered in a domestic violence situation, it was when they were leaving the abusive partner. A very dangerous time for them. So when somebody gets a court order and makes a move to change what's going on, we do ask them to come and stay at the shelter for at least a day or two until the most dangerous period is over. One final question. Uh, I'm assuming you do follow-ups uh, on, on people that come to stay there? Yes. Um, yeah, we After have, they've left? Yeah, actually a pattern where we will check with them in a day or two, and we'll check with them in a week, and in three weeks, and in six weeks, and in six months. Um, many times they're hard to reach. They're in a system of hiding many times and moving around. So sometimes we can't get a hold of them. Sometimes they go back to the abusive situation and try it again. They often hope and believe that if they've made one move to change a situation to say, no, I won't tolerate the abuse, that it'll stop. And so they do try it again and again. And sometimes it works. Sometimes it does stop. Most of the time it does not. So sometimes it's very hard to reach out to them and find them again afterwards. But for those we do, those who are successful and either the abusive partner gets help and changes or they've separated in order to be safe. Um, many give back. They give back to the community. They give back to our program. They work again for safe avenues or they work in other places out in the community where they can share that there's help out there. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you City Council. Any other questions? I have one more. Mm -hmm. Safe avenues. Safe avenues. Has offices in Olivia, Montevideo, Benson and Wilmer. Right? Exactly. Okay. They're good. But the only shelter is here in Wilmer? The only shelter for 18 counties in southwest Minnesota is here in Wilmer. <coughs> and the offices in those other cities that I mentioned? Yes. Um, can you tell me what, uh, what takes place there? Yeah, they do a lot of safety planning with people in our offices in Olivia, Benson, and Montevideo. Um, they do court advocacy. They help them attain order of protection or harass restraining order. They help them to report to law enforcement to make sure law enforcement understands all that's happened in the situation and make some wise choices of, uh, about charging. They work with the city attorneys and the courts when there are charges, when they need to go to court. A very dangerous and scary thing to do for the victim, but they need to be there to testify. We offer supplies and phone cards. Um, we help them to change their address, change their locks on their doors, anything that it takes for safety planning for them to stay safe. Many of the people that need help but don't need shelter do stay with a family member or a friend or have an order for protection to have the abuser taken out of the home. It's not really any different than somebody staying in the shelter. They just don't need the shelter service. Yeah. And the other 12 counties where we don't have programs do have offices much like we have in Olivia and Benson and Montevideo. And, the, and your financial support comes from? Um, we have the most complicated funding plan you could ever imagine, but uh, we do get some state funding through the Department of Public Safety. Um, we get some federal funds flowing through the, straight, uh, through the state. Some comes from the VAWA Act, the Violence Against Women Act. Some comes from VOCA, Victims of Crime Act. And some of that money is collected from large corporate crimes. It's handed down to serve victims of crimes, which is very fitting. We also do a gala every year. You're invited to come. It's a very fun event. We do raise some money for the shelter and for our programs at Safe Avenues. Uh, we have a lot of community partners who give from their own pocketbooks and from their hearts because they want to make a difference. They want to see victims have their life turned around and be able to give back. Um, it's a lot of events. We're hoping to have a bike-a-thon in the spring. We have a couple of bikers right here on the city council. So I <laughs> hope you'll join us for that. We're hoping. <laughs> All right, Connie. Thank you very much for being here tonight, and uh, see you tomorrow night. All right. Thank you. Right. I am going to uh, pass out just the information about our name change, so you all have that to share. Okay. Uh, maybe you want to just give it to Kevin. Uh, <coughs> thanks, Connie. Thank you.
Next item is the uh, City Council Open Forum. Uh, Kevin, did anybody sign up? Doesn't look like it. Okay. Um, <coughs> Finance Committee Report. Council Member Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor Pro Tem. The uh, first item on our agenda was a discussion of the Mayor's proposed budget, and this was where we received public comments. Uh, no one was present at the meeting, but we did get an email which was read and it came from a concerned citizen suggesting the council consider contracting out some city services and that a task force be appointed <laughs> to determine whether or not this might be cost effective. That was referred to staff and they will be reporting back with their thoughts at the first finance committee meeting in December. Uh, that was for information only. Second item also had to do with the 2011 budget. We continued our review of the mayor's proposed 2011 budget by considering the uh, fund balances. Fund designations and level, policy, level policies were once again received for information and will be available for discussion at the November 22nd meeting. Uh, Finance Director Okins also reviewed the various groups of expenditures with the committee. We also had a little bit of a discussion on that November 22nd budget meeting. Um, it had been started at 5 o'clock a few years ago. We went to the Holiday Inn starting last year. We were at the, uh, I think at the, at the fire station. And I think it would make sense to start that a little before 5. Nothing is set in, in concrete at this time, but we do have to receive the reports from the uh, HRA, MUC, and Rice Hospital. And so I think for planning purposes, you should think about that starting about 3 o'clock uh, that afternoon of November 22nd. Nothing's been firmed up on that, but for your own planning, you might, you might pencil that in. That was all for information. Uh, finally, we received the August uh, Rice Trust Report. Unless there's questions, uh, I would move to file these minutes. Second. Got a motion and a second. Any questions? Not all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? <coughs> Motion carries. Public Works Safety Committee report. Um, Public Works Safety Committee met uh, Tuesday, September 28th. First item on the uh, table was uh, an activity, a criminal activity report from our police chief. And uh, <coughs> He went through uh, recent criminal activity in the southeast sector of Wilmer, uh, more specifically between 1st Street to Lakeland Drive and from Highway 12 to Wilmer Avenue. And there has been uh, uh, a number of letters and citizen concerns that have come to council members uh, of the overabundance of, of serious crimes in this area. And each uh, the ch chief, uh, as he outlined uh, the criminal activity, um, he told the committee that each incident occurring in the last six weeks was um, separate cases, and there was no real tie-in to each uh, case uh, from one to another, and. Uh, he uh, included arrest information in his report. That was for information only. Um, the second item was uh, the Clean Water Revolving Fund Loan Agreement. And Rhonda Ray from Don and Yuna Associates was at our meeting, and she presented a change order to the loan agreement with the Minnesota public facilities authority for funds under the clean water revolving fund program. The agreement includes funding for project 1017B, the decommissioning of our uh, old wastewater <coughs> treatment facility. This change order uh, will separate this project into two phases, the first being the decommissioning of the existing wastewater treatment facility. The second is the decommissioning of both the Arby's and the Ortenblad lift stations, including the installation of the gravity connection from the Ortenblad lift station to the new southern interceptor. 
um, and then uh, a motion was made and I would introduce a resolution to approve the change order to the loan agreement with the Minnesota PFA uh, Clean Water Revolving Fund and amend the uh, city budgets accordingly. Second. We have a second. Any uh, discussion? Questions? If not, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Roll call, please. Aye. I'm sorry. It's a resolution. Roll call. Council Member Christensen. Aye. Anderson. Aye. Johnson. Aye. Dockin. Aye. Fagerly. Aye. Dablique. Aye. Reese. Aye. Seven ayes, zero nays. And one one note with that as we're as we were talking about the uh, uh, <coughs> changes and uh, talking a little about the wastewater treatment facility. Just one note that uh, I guess more for the publics, but maybe for some of the council members that weren't at the meeting, uh, but for the public's information, um, as of Tuesday, the 28th, uh, all flow has been directed to our new wastewater treatment facility, and uh, the uh, old wastewater treatment facility is shut down and is being cleaned up and going to be decommissioned. So um, many years of work um, now uh, in total function, our new wastewater treatment facility. So that is really quite exciting um, to have that flow all directed to our new plant. The next item was uh, in regards to uh, safe and sober grant. This is something that the city has uh, participated in for years. And Chief Weifels uh, is requesting permission to participate in the same program again. And uh, as in the past, uh, the city of Wilmer will be collaborating with the Candy Oye County Sheriff's Office, the Atwater Police Department, the Swift County Sheriff's Office, and the Benson Police Department. And uh, this program allows for a concentrated effort on traffic safety. The total amount of the grant is $30,000. There's no local match other than operational costs of our police vehicles. And that's the way it has been always in the past. So I would introduce a resolution to authorize the police department to enter into a grant agreement and authorize staff to execute agreements and amendments as necessary. Second. We have a motion and a second. Uh, questions? No questions. Roll call. Council Member Anderson. Aye. Johnson? Aye. Dockin? Aye. Fagerly? Aye. Kablik? Aye. Reese? Aye. Christensen? Aye. Seven ayes, zero nays. The next item was, is in regards to uh, a grant for reimbursement funds from the Minnesota Board of Firefighting Training and Education uh, for our fire department uh, in the amount of $9,400 to be used towards training of our firefighters. Um, these training courses uh, are planned to be completed by June of next year and uh, Chief Calvin is requesting permission to submit a final application and accept the funds. Uh, I would introduce a resolution to apply and accept the reimbursement funds not to exceed $9,400 and adjust the fire department's 2010 and 2011 budgets accordingly. Second. We have a motion and a second. Uh, questions? No questions? Uh, roll call. Council Member Johnson? Aye. Dockin? Aye. Baggerly? Aye. Tablique? Aye. Reese? Aye. Christensen? Aye. Anderson? Aye. Seven ayes, zero nays. There was uh, some miscellaneous discussions that were for information only in regards to future path projects and connections and street construction status and busing issues near Roosevelt School. That was the extent of the uh, uh, minutes. Uh, I would move to file the minutes. If there's questions, we can address them. Second. We have a motion and a second. Questions? Councilmember Dockin. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. I want to go back to uh, item number one. I've been thinking about this a, a lot. Uh, 
the uh, the crime of whatever kind seems to be happening quite frequently in uh, rental housing, and I'm wondering if we if it wouldn't be uh, important for us to look at rental housing like we look at multi uh, apartment living, where they have a program that's called crime free multi housing. The people can do background checks on those folks, and uh, they can refuse, as I understand, to not rent to them. Why would we not want to at least look at doing something like that with respect to rentals when we have uh, numbers of calls from a, a specific house on a specific street or avenue? Uh, and hold the landlords a little more accountable for who they are renting to. This is a program that you've... Uh... It's, it's in force right now in w Willow Run. All of the larger complexes, they have what's called uh, crime-free multi-housing. Uh, is it a form, Mick, or what is it called? I'm not really sure. I know the program exists. I think it's through the HRA, maybe, right? Mm -hmm. But I think it's worth looking at with respect to rentals. Um, yeah, I, I think that can be referred to a committee. I, I on the you know, legality, I guess I'm thinking of, and uh, whether or not that's something that uh, I think it should be looked into. But I, I'm I'm questioning whether or not there can be that kind of subjectivity in rental, but it seems. Um, like it could be discriminatory. I'm not. I'm not sure. Yeah, Jim, go ahead. Ron. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor Pro Tem. Um, I, I sit as a liaison on the HRA board, and um, all the HR facil HRA facilities uh, are, are in this program. And I believe it is it Mary Lee Doran that's the uh, staff person at the police department. Um, she meets with them and uh, they go over, I think it's crime-free rental housing, I think is the name of it. And uh, a lot of the private uh, sector apartments belong to that also. I know that Willow Run does and uh, some apartments on Lakeland, Lakeland Avenue. Um, and it might be worth looking into. I don't think there's any legal issues with it, but uh, I suggest we uh, discuss it at a public works meeting. So this would be something that each, I mean, if, if, if I owned it, a house or two, I would have to adopt this. I don't think it's a matter of adopting. I think it's, it's participating in the program, participating in it, and, uh, uh, and you can participate as, as much as you want or as little as you want, I guess. But they do meet and uh, go over lighting, security, um, background checks for uh, uh, potential renters, things like that. And uh, Mary Lee brings out uh, forms with all these questions and uh, related to safety and, uh, and renting. Well, maybe we ought to uh, uh, take this uh, for information and uh, maybe uh, refer it to uh, public safety and maybe staff can look into this a little bit. We'll do some research on it and report back to committee. Would appreciate it. Thank you, Jim. Any Anything else? We didn't pass that yet, did we? Kevin? Not the motion. All right. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? <coughs> Motion carries. Consideration of final plat, Cambridge Second Edition. Bruce? Here, Pro Tem Reese, members of the council. Cambridge Second Edition is a plat being developed by KLC of Wilmer. The plat is south of Oxford Drive Southeast and west of 15th Street Southeast. It is a 14 lot plat and four of the lots are splits of existing duplexes. This plat is part of a planned unit development that will uh, surround the large stormwater retention pond that was built out there probably five years ago now. 
and the Planning Commission has approved the final plat with several conditions regarding existing assessments and some stormwater requirements. Uh, staff recommends approval of the final plat uh, with the understanding that signatures will be withheld until those final conditions have been met by the developer. So we're looking for approval of the plat? <coughs> That's correct. Move to approve. Second. second. Okay, we got a motion and a second. Discussion? No discussion. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Consideration of resolution the election judges for November 2nd general election. Kevin. Mayor Pro Tem, members of the council, pursuant to state statutes, we need to adopt a resolution informing the public who the election judges are in their various precincts. They are listed there for your perusal, and it is staff's recommendation that you adopt the resolution. Move to approve. Second. We have a motion and a second to uh, approve this resolution. Questions, concerns? Councilmember Christensen. Thank you, Mr. Mayor Pro Tem. Uh, I'm just curious. Do, uh, do you have to be a citizen of Wilmer to, to be on these? Uh, Candio High County for about eight years. Prior to that, it was. So for the past eight or ten years, you have to be in Candio High County. Okay, so then people on these uh, or in each precinct, they don't have to belong to that ward. Then you can you can come from. Uh, that is City correct. of Candy, Ohio, and, and, and sit on one of these in Wilmer. We begin with uh, lists from the DFL and the uh, Republican parties when they hold their caucuses, and they submit those to the auditor, and we need to put them on. And then we call people in Wilmer, and then last resort is we move out to get them. Okay. We've only had a few that aren't Wilmer uh, many times some Atwater and so forth, but they were in Wilmer at one time and moved to a lake or something, but they were great judges, so we kept them on. But as we turn over, we try to keep them in Wilmer. So we don't have a problem getting judges for these then? If it's oh, we have problems. We don't have a waiting list that we like. Many times we adopt this, and then someone will be have a medical emergency at the end, and we have a couple people on the waiting list. It's always nice to have five or six on the waiting list. As I understand it, they get paid also, right? They get paid three different wages, $8 if it's their first election, $9 if they are per hour now, <laughs> $9 if they've got experience, and 10 for a head judge. Is, is this advertised anywhere, Kevin, or is this, uh, you don't put it in the paper? Or, uh... Uh, well, we don't, haven't been to that point. We've got the word out or on the open mic program the word might go out or through the DFL IR parties it goes out and we get the job done but it, it's more than an hour's worth of work. That's what they tell me. <laughs> it's a day's more than Long a day's. Long days, a lot of training. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? And that is a roll call. Council Member Dockin. Aye. Baggerly. Aye. DeBleek. Aye. Reese. Aye. Christensen. Aye. Anderson. Aye. Johnson. Aye. Seven ayes, zero nays. Next is a uh, resolution for certification of unpaid utility chargers, charges as a lien. Kevin. Mayor Pro Tem, members of the council, once a year the Utilities Commission offers hearings to those people who have unpaid uh, utility charges, offering them the opportunity to come and explain what kind of circumstances may prevent them from making payment on their bills. This year there's a larger list than we have ever had, and those are before you for your perusal. The Commission offered those for a September 22nd uh, meeting, I believe, and nobody asked to have a hearing. And so subsequent to that, they submit these to the city and we put the legal addresses together that are on that list and it is staff's recommendation that we adopt this resolution placing all of these charges against the respective parcels for collection in 2011. Mayor Pro Tem. 
Introduce the resolution. All right. Second. Got a um, motion and a second to adopt the resolution. Questions? That's member Christian. Thank you, Mr. Mayor Pro Tem. I'm just curious, Kevin. Do we know what percentage of these are rentals or absentee landlords or of that nature? Or are there most of them owner operated or occupied? We don't. I should know this answer from rental. Zero would be rentals because the renter comes and makes the deposit and you can't come back against the landlord for that renter. And so we're going against these owned properties. I think by process of elimination the answer is zero rentals. But staff should review that and get a okay, firm thank answer for you. Thank you. I was just curious. Okay. <coughs> Any other questions? Roll call. Council Member Fagerly. Aye. DeBleek. Aye. Reese. Aye. Christensen. Aye. Anderson. Aye. Johnson. Aye. Dockin. Aye. Seven ayes, zero nays. And that resolution passes. The uh, next is the committee meeting dates. Finance. <coughs> Mr. Mayor Pro Tem, Finance Committee will meet Monday the 11th at 4:45. <coughs> And uh, Public Works Public Safety will be meeting um, Tuesday the 12th at 445. Um, how about labor? Uh, Steve's not here. Is there any meeting for labor? No. Um, community, development. community development? This community development will meet uh, October 14th, 445. Okay. One uh, announcement um, under miscellaneous, and that is that there's going to be a uh, community-oriented policing and problem-solving meeting uh, tomorrow night at 7 p.m. at the fire hall, and all citizens are uh, invited to attend. Tomorrow. Um, I was informed before the meeting started that uh, we will not be closing the meeting as uh, previously indicated. Marv, do you have something? Okay, okay. Um, but we're going to adjourn, adjourn but we until need, the time. Until we need to, but we need to find a specific time this, well, not this week. Uh, we can this week, but go ahead, Kevin. Mayor Pro Tem, members of the council, we were having a closed meeting with the attorney-client privilege. To do that, a requirement would be to have an attorney. Since we do not have one, that criteria is not filled. <laughs> An acting city attorney, uh, not a standing council member attorney. And uh, there are concerns that uh, not critical on time, but I guess they asked him to go over the mediation activities from the wastewater treatment land acquisitions. If there was no time to meet, you could make it the next time after the council. But it is recommended that we find a date this week or before that two-week period where we can meet and discuss these items with our attorney. So any day post 4.30, if you can't find one, I guess we go all the way to the next council Post meeting. Post four thirty, because I was going earlier. You and I had discussed possibly even a noon, <clears throat> and a noon would probably work too. I guess we, we got to make sure the attorney is there, and I guess if you could make any input as to would the court keep him over noon? Right. Possible, always possible. Always possible. Not likely, but possible. But not likely. Let's try to find the best thing, Mr. Mayor Pro Tem, and we'll make, try to make it work. So, um, I don't know what, what works for everybody. I, I'm just looking at my calendar, and I, I thought the, the, you know the sooner we get it done, the better in my estimation and I, I was wondering if Wednesday noon if people can make it I don't know you no absolutely not you can't on Wednesdays noons it have to be after four then Bruce 
Yeah. What is the um, what does everybody want to do? Um, do you want to wait until the next council meeting on the 18th? I mean, we've been sitting in this litigation for. Can anybody meet at four o'clock before one of the announced meetings? Well, that we could maybe do. Well, are you able to be there by the four o'clock, Rick? Yeah, Jim. Jim, what day? Well, either uh, Monday or Tuesday. Yeah, Monday or Tuesday would work for me, but Wednesday or Thursday won't. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to work. Yeah. I think the Tuesday would work better. Tuesday would work better. Okay. So we will go with Tuesday the 12th at 4 o'clock. That's assuming the city attorney is available. Well, if, if he, not, we will likely then wait until the council next meeting. council meeting. Sounds good. Sounds like a plan. Okay. Okay. Hey, what, Chief, uh, Mr. Uh, Chairman, Mayor Pro Tem, <laughs> <laughs> Doug, <laughs> uh, we will need to. Um, well, what happens if it doesn't? work out for Tuesday. They have to adjourn to a specific time? Correct. To keep the meeting open without announcing anything. So then the three-day rule wouldn't have even mattered. The three-day announcement rule. So, which is beyond that. But the bottom line is that should be the last action. So I guess we have to go back to the chief and then make a motion to adjourn. Or if they just decide to do it at the next council meeting we can adjourn this meeting and schedule it for the next agenda that's always an option but this other option is better take the date and if you feel a little bit no of urgency Kevin it would be better to work on the details earlier than later I think the plan is a good one let's just stay with the plan Hope we have a quorum and hope we have an attorney. And if we don't have an attorney? We just, there is no meeting and it goes to the next council. And how do we adjourn or this quorum, meeting? Or quorum, either one. Just well, it adjourn by default then. It would. Sure, you'd have no quorum or no functional meeting. You have to have that attorney to close the door. So when we adjourn, the motion would be to adjourn until October 12, 4 p.m which at that time will reconvene. Okay? All right? Or is it close or adjourn? Adjourn. It is. Yeah. Okay. Yep. All right. That's the right language. Chief Calvin. <laughs> I certainly didn't mean to make a big issue out of making an announcement of our story time at the fire station tomorrow night at 6 o'clock. So that's our story time. We do it uh, with uh, early childhood family education. And uh, 6 o'clock tomorrow at the fire station, come on over there. We will have something to eat for you. And then we also have the story that we will read to the youngsters. Also just want to announce that one of our firefighters' uh, wives has uh, brain cancer. And we're going to be doing a fundraiser for her on October 30th at E-Free Church. So just those two quick announcements. Thank you, Mark. Um, Councilmember Christensen brought to my attention. I forgot that. Uh, is, it, is it tomorrow or is it Wednesday? Is it tomorrow? Utilities get tomorrow. To see, that's four tomorrow. to six thirty. It is tomorrow. Tomorrow. Six okay, seven. four to six thirty um, is the annual um, dinner and appreciation Appreciate. for the municipal uh, Wilmer Municipal Utilities, and that will be. At the Civic Center, okay, from at the Civic Center from 4 to 6:30. So you can go from the Civic Center to Robbins Island to the fire station, <laughs> <laughs> and get plenty to eat. Get plenty to eat. Oh. Yep. <laughs> and proclaim too. So, all and, right. And the concert series is tomorrow night too. Yeah. Oh my. Anything else? <laughs> Right. Councilmember Dockin. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Uh, I was listening on open mic today when uh, JP and Mick were talking, and I know there was a question on street in our street program. Is there? C could we get an update on how things are going with the weather, the rain? 
Um, I'll let Holly give you an update on the um, <laughs> status of our projects, but this is an opportunity for me to correct myself because when I was asked a question on Open Mech, I said, I hope I'm not speaking, and then went on to answer the question, and I misspoke. Uh, the question was, in a situation where we do a mill and overlay and spot replacement of, of curbing that is in need of replacement, does the homeowner that doesn't have any curb removed and replaced pay the same assessment as the homeowner who may have had replacement? And I said, gee, I, I guess I would think the... Um, the assessments would be based on what actually took place in front of your property and that is not the case on a on a mill and an overlay we figure out the total cost of the project and then assess it out equally and I hope the young lady who called and asked me that question is watching the program tonight <laughs> uh, otherwise I'll, I'll uh, try to clear it up at the next uh, open mic program but uh, Holly can give us a status report on the projects. Holly? Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem, members of the council. Um, the, the street program is progressing at a, at a slow pace, but 7th Street um, was being graded and the uh, fill was being put in. Uh, the water main had been tested and um, okayed so that grading work and filling has been taking place today um, they've also done some grading on 14th <clears throat> 14th Avenue today um, and hoping to keep progressing on that project uh, 12th Street Southeast they're hoping to um, start removing some pavement and beginning on that as far as the mill and overlay those projects will hopefully be seeing some activity within the next two weeks with this nice weather. Um, the other pieces of uh, concern are Valley Brook. That was cleaned up um, over the weekend. There are some structures and castings still that need to be cut in and, and um, adjusted. But they're working diligently to keep the project moving as best as we can. All right. Mr. Mayor, as long as we're talking about streets, would you allow, and we have plenty of time here, would you <laughs> allow me to talk a little bit about the Roosevelt Road and bus patterns? I noticed when I came back uh, from being gone a few days a uh, series of emails that were um, talking about the, the bus patterns uh, behind Roosevelt and complaints specifically from the people north and east of the new uh, roadway that too many buses were going in that direction. And I just wanted to clear up uh, what discussions took place when this road was built. Uh, Dr. Kiergaard approached me uh, early in the process and asked if the city would be uh, in a position to include this roadway in our 2010 program and after we discussed uh, possibilities and design issues we agreed to include it with the understanding that all of the buses w when leaving the roadway would travel west to 22nd Street and then disperse either north and south from there. And I know that Dr. Kiergaard uh, talked to the bus company about this, and I assumed, and Dr. Kiergaard did as well, that that is exactly what would happen. We knew that there may be an exception, one, two, or three buses that might, for some reason, have to to turn right and go through that residential area but not a majority of the buses for sure. Uh, I, I talked to Dr. Kiergaard about two weeks ago when Mr. Christensen contacted me he had received a phone call or 
an email from someone who was concerned about the number of buses going east. Uh, Dr. Kiergaard assured me that he was going to meet with the bus company and make sure that w our understanding was intact. I never did participate in the discussions with the bus company, so I'm relying on what the, uh, Dr. Kiergaard told me. Uh, I try, uh, then I came back from being away for a few days and I saw that series of, of emails. And I will um, contact Mr. Uh, Buteau and, and let him know what the original verbal agreement was for traffic patterns. I called Dr. Kiergaard's office this morning. Uh, he was not available and won't be until Wednesday. I talked to the principal at Roosevelt School who called the uh, bus company and talked to them. and. When she got back to me, she she thought the best thing to do was wait until Dr. Kiergaard returned to the office on Wednesday. But the original agreement, and it was all verbal, there were no written agreements, was that uh, we knew that all of this bus traffic could not go through that residential area, so we made it a point uh, when talking to the bus company about the new parking area for buses and ingress and egress that they would leave and arrive uh, to and from the west. So that's where we are today and and uh, as soon as Dr. Kiergaard gets back um, I'll find out from him what his discussions with the bus company were unless we have some inside information here where uh, uh, we might get some assistance, but we're working on the matter, and we know it. It's a concern. The the principal at Roosevelt told me that in the morning, generally speaking, most of the traffic is coming into the roadway from the west, but she thought most of it leaving in the afternoon was going to the east. So, we have some work to do, but our original commitment was to um, avoid that pattern as best we could. Whenever possible. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Anything else? All right. Thank you, Mick. Um, so then we need a motion to adjourn to the 12th until the 12th. 4 p.m. 4 p.m. At 4 p.m. So moved. So seconded. <laughs> okay, we got a motion and a second to adjourn this meeting until Tuesday the 12th at 4 p.m. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Carries. We are adjourned. <laughs>